I would like to thank the RCPCH and uh, my long-standing friend, uh, Professor Mike Dillon, in particular, for inviting me to deliver this lecture this morning. I want to tell you all something about the history of pediatrics in the country where I was born and I have worked right throughout my life. These are some statistics, some demographic data. Ours has been a low-income country for a long time, but recently graduated to become a middle-income country. Now, in spite of that, I think our health parameters are remarkable. The infant mortality rate is a single digit. Neonatal mortality rate, single digit, below five. Five-year mortality, 7.4. And very proud about the rate of exclusive breastfeeding, which goes on for six months. Our politicians were wise enough to give extended maternity leave of up to 84 working days. Now I'll you take you through the ages. Our Sri Lankan medical traditions record back to the prehistoric era. And ancient Sri Lankans were responsible for the concept of hospitals. Sri Lanka claims to be the first country in the world to have established dedicated hospitals in fourth century. BC. We claim that the oldest hospital in the world is in Mihintale, which was built by King Senator II, 851 to 885 current era. As you can see, some oil baths in the middle, the top, mortars, grinding stones and some stone pillars on which the hospital was built. Now that's uh, what we call a behet porua or an oil bath. And clearly it's only 100 centimeters long, so it was meant for infants. Our kings, several kings of ancient Sri Lanka are known to have been practitioners of medicine starting with King Buddha Dasa, King Parakrama Babu, and King Ravana. These are some of the ancient surgical instruments that have been used by our ancestors. <coughs> you see, very basic, like calipers, some sort of knives, etc. I think some of you all have been to Lady Ridge Hospital. The predecessor was Lady Havelock Hospital for women and children, which was founded in 1896. And the Lady Ridge Hospital, which is currently the largest children's hospital in the world, I stand to be corrected, it has 1,016 beds. And that uh, blue building, uh, that's a new part of the Lady Ridge Hospital that was uh, built with a donation from the Chinese government. And this Leverage Hospital was founded in 1910. And the governor at that time, he said that Ceylon is proud of his medical service and justly proud. And it has always been a great pleasure to me to be associated with it. The medical service of Ceylon is Ceylonese, essentially Ceylonese, and Ceylonese, I hope it will remain. So West Ridgeway, 1903, and the hospital, Lady Ridgeway Hospital, is named after his wife. More recently, the Sirimao Bandaranaka Children's Hospital was opened in Behrendenia, 
that's close to Kandy. As you all know, Sri Mahu Bandar Naik was the first woman prime minister of the world. She became the prime minister uh, about 50 years ago. Now, the first medical school was opened by Reverend Samuel Green in the Jaffna Peninsula in Manipal. He went on to learn Tamil and write textbooks of medicine in Tamil. And the students were sent to India, South India, for their clinical studies. The Ceylon Medical College, where I graduated from, and Dr. Ruan Jisodisa, who is in the audience, he is also an alumnus of that medical school, was founded in 1870. And later on, when the University of Ceylon was created, it was renamed the Faculty of Medicine. Then the second medical school was opened in Peradeniya in 1962. Uh, in 1982, faculties were opened, one in the south, in Rohna, in Gaul, and the other one in Jaffna. And I was a senior lecturer at that time, and I went down to Gaul and I found the professor of pediatrics in the University of Rohna in 1980. And I returned to Colombo in 1991 when the chair fell vacant. At present, there are 12 medical faculties in Sri Lanka. And mind you, <coughs> primary education, secondary education, and tertiary education in all the medical schools is provided free. No fees are charged. We are proud of, of what we have achieved in immunization. There is about 99% coverage for the EPI vaccines in infancy. It was in 1802 that the first vaccination of a child was done. That was the smallpox vaccination. We eradicated poliomyelitis way back in 1993. Maternal and neonatal tetanus in 2009. Congenital rubella syndrome two years later. And now there are hardly any outbreaks of measles or diphtheria. Fortunately, still, vaccine hesitancy has not invaded the shores of Sri Lanka. We are very fortunate, although it is prevalent in India. And all the vaccines are provided free of charge. So the expanded, pro, uh, uh, expanded program of immunization, children are given birth, uh, birth the BCG vaccine, and almost 100% of births are in hospitals. So therefore, about 100% receive the BCG vaccination at birth. Then we give the pentavalent vaccine at two, four, and six months, MMR at nine months, the first dose, Japanese encephalitis, which became a problem in 1980, it has been eliminated now. It's given at 12 months, then uh, the rest of the vaccines are given there. And the most recent uh, is the human papilloma virus, which is given uh, to 11 year old school girls. And in my practice now, after the consultation is over, and if the mother is under 40 years, I bring up this issue about malignancies in women and I ask them what is the commonest site most of them tell me it's the breast then they say it's the womb and I say it's preventable and if they're under 40 years I prescribe the HPV vaccine to them and it costs about 4,400 rupees and they have to take as you know three doses and most of them they accept it. There are non-EPI vaccines available in the private sector both the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, Simplorix, <coughs> the polysaccharide vaccine that has been available for a long time and is given for patients uh, who have their screens removed when they have thalassemia in their second decade of life. Varicella, rotavirus, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, the combined vaccine, influenza vaccine, and the COVID-19 vaccine. We have not started giving the COVID-19 vaccine to children as yet. So these are the significant milestones in pediatrics. 
the south of the country, the first orphanage was started in 1850. The first book in pediatrics, Sinhala, was written in 1873. The first cesarean birth was in 1905. The first pediatrician to be appointed was Dr. Dr. Ello that was in 1937. Then that same year, pediatrics was taught to medical students. The first professor of pediatrics, Professor C.C. C. De Silva, was appointed in 1948. Then the Journal of Children's Hospital, the first publication in pediatrics, 1951. The Ceylon Pediatric Association was started in 1953. The first issue of the Ceylon Journal of Child Health, which is now called the Sri Lanka Journal of Child Health, was in 63. The Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians was founded one month before the British Pediatric Association became the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. It happened in the same year. Uh, Child Health uh, Protection Authority was established in 1999, Perinatal Society in 2001, and an international cardiology unit was established, open at Ledridge Hospital in the year 2000. So, as I said, the Kalapa Medical School established in 1870, it is the second oldest medical school in Australasia. The oldest medical school in Australasia is in uh, Calcutta, but uh, I think it's a low-key medical school now. Was Colombo has uh, gone from strength to strength. That's the first professor of pediatrics, Professor C. 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 De Silva, who retired in 1966. These are the office bearers of the Ceylon Pediatric Association. The president was the first pediatrician in the country, Dr. Elo Abiratna. Vice president was Professor C. C. De Silva. And Professor Milroy Paul, who was the professor of surgery, who was the secretary. Uh, we have had some very distinguished pediatricians as chief guests attending our annual sessions. Martin Wardian from Great Ormond Street and Sidney Gellis from Boston Children's Hospital. <coughs> Over the years, pediatrics have developed as a science in Sri Lanka. And these are some other personalities who have contributed starting from the left hand top corner, that's Dr. Uh, Elo Averatna. Next to him is Professor C. C. D. Silva. In the next row is Professor Milray Paul. The lady there is a, was the first professor uh, of any discipline in, uh, in Ceylon at that time, that's Professor Priya and whom I succeeded in 1991. At the bottom is Professor Herbert Aponso, who was a professor of pediatrics for a long time at Peradenia. Next to him is Dr. Stella De Silva, an <coughs> excellent clinician who taught him. <coughs> then, on the right side, Dr. Benjamin David, and you can identify who is next to him. Below Benjamin David is Professor Narodavana Surya. Next to him is uh, Harendra De Silva. We have done a lot of work for child protection. And the bottom is Dr. G. N. Lucas, who is one of the editors of the journal, and Asiria Begulodana, who is currently the dean and the professor of pediatrics at Peradini. And of course, there are many more. Now, evaluation in pediatrics. After the 1980s, it was part of general medicine. And students like me, did not consider it seriously. And I got, I got a distinction in medicine at the final exam without knowing any pediatrics at all. You could, one could easily qualify as a doctor without <coughs> much knowledge of pediatrics. Once I became a professor of pediatrics, that was in goal, I was determined to make pediatrics a separate subject at the final year exam. Because students, medical students, if they know that they are what they have been taught is being evaluated and given marks, then they will take it seriously, not otherwise. So after 1980, pediatrics was evaluated as a separate subject at the final MBBS examination in all medical faculties. 
And as a result, the graduates became more competent in pediatrics. There were changes in the medical <coughs> curriculum in the 1990s, and the medical faculty changed its medical curriculum drastically. And I was closely involved with that. Until then, it was a traditional British curriculum with the second MB, third MB, and final MB. The traditional curriculum persisted from 1870 to the mid 1990s with only minor changes. And the new curriculum, it was problem based learning, small group discussions, uh, 12 to 20 students per group, emphasis on self learning, integrated teaching sessions, there were different streams, introductory basic science stream. Applied Sciences, Clinical Sciences, I was the first chairman of the Clinical Sciences stream, Community Sciences and Behavioral Sciences. Now the other medical faculties have gradually changed their curriculum. Uh, before 1980, we had to come here to acquire either the MRCT or the FRCS. So British postgraduate degrees are recognized. After 1980, local postgraduate degrees are recognized and the PGIN <coughs> conducts the MD examination, and there are some people here who have come to Sri Lanka as external examiners. So it was established in 1980. <coughs> the National Institute affiliated the UNESCO at Colombo, organizes training and evaluation, and with participation of external examiners, usually from the UK, and there are both a study for the dis different disciplines. So it has been established, now postgraduate education has been established for over 40 years, it has produced about 400 pediatricians since 1982 with local specialist qualifications. We undertake training of doctors from overseas. I have trained doctors from Bhutan to be pediatricians, and I have been invited to Pakistan to participate in their postgraduate <coughs> examinations. Uh, <coughs> In the boards of study in pediatrics, there are representatives from the universities, Ministry of Health, and the professional colleges. Uh, it organizes and monitors the training program, and it conducts examinations with participation of external foreign examiners. And we have established subspecialties over the years, starting with neonatology, and the newest is community pediatrics and genetics. Genetics, there are two under training in this country. They are now returned as zero. Uh, foreign training is for one to two years. Most of them, they come here. Uh, I think some of you all would have had Sri Lankan trainees. Uh, they, some of them go to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Singapore, and Hong Kong, and India. <coughs> and here, of course, I think they get a very good deal. They get paid jobs in the National Health Service. And uh, sometimes they are, have an observer status, and the PGIM pays them 25,000 pounds per year. The main centers of training have been Sandwell, where one of my students and registrars, Rasika Jayatunga, has organized training for me. Then Tim Chambers, who has visited Sri Lanka several times as an external examiner, he has organized training slots in Bristol. And currently, Amit Gupta, who is in Oxford, is organizing many, many training slots for our trainees. So, these are the years that uh, the subspecialties were established and the number of subspecialists who have been board certified. You, so you can see we have grown fairly rapidly in our uh, postgraduate subspecialties and they are found all over the country. So the present situation, PGIM has produced over 400 pediatricians during the last 40 years and about 300 pediatricians are in post. The brain drain is high. Undergraduate and postgraduate education is provided free of charge. Unfortunately, there is no compulsory period of service. So they are free to go abroad. When this matter was raised by some of us, one of the presidents of the country, Jaya Jayawardena, he said, it's against the human rights to be asked to serve the country on a compulsory basis. My reply was, it's against the human rights of the general public who pay taxes 
for their education, for them to receive medical education and then leave the country without serving the public. Anyway, still there is no compulsory <coughs> period of service. <coughs> now, you can't read that, what's in that aerogram. This letter was signed by Michael Moss, very good friend of mine, senior registrar in orthodontics. Letter is dated 16th of November 1982. I was working at the old Mahamodara hospital in Gaul by the sea. And I am fond of playing billiards. In the evenings, I used to go to the Gaul Services Club to play billiards. And the marker there, the billiard marker, was a lab attendant in a technical school very close to the hospital. He came and gave me this letter. The letter had been delivered <coughs> to the technical college, although it was addressed to me. Basically, what he said was that <coughs> in patients who have been operated for a cleft palate at the conventional time, they have poor growth of the middle third of the face. And in the UK, they spend thousands of pounds in late adolescence to do surgery to bring the middle third of the face forward. Controversy was whether it is iatrogenic as a result of surgery or whether there was an intrinsic birth defect. And the question that Michael asked was, this is the problem. Do you have patients born with cleft palates who have not had conventional surgery, uh, surgery at the conventional time? If so, are you willing to participate in a research project? I said yes to both. And Michael came with uh, the David James, a maxillofacial surgeon from Great Ormond Street, and I collected about 30 patients, and they took photographs, skull x-rays, lateral skull x-ray with a cephalostat, dental uh, impressions, and they were very happy with the material I had collected. Then they said they want to come again. I told them, you are welcome, but please remember if you come again, these poor patients should benefit from your visit. Then he asked, what can you provide? Knowing the British very well, I said I can provide an operating table, a theater lamp, oxygen, anesthetic gases, and nothing else. <laughs> they got the message. The whole surgical team arrived with 30 crates airlifted. Theater boots, cotton wool, socks, you name it, all that was there. And they made two <coughs> surgical expeditions, and the directors of the project, is called the Sri Lanka Little and Panel Project, Michael Mars from here, and I, I was the professor of pediatrics at Rune at that time, so we were the two directors of the project. And children as well as adults to operate well. This is Samuel, Michael's favorite patient, a carpenter from Baddegam, down south. He, he was so ashamed of his face, he never went out in search of work. People brought, he was a very good carpenter. People used to bring work home, and he did all his carpentry at home. He was operated, and that's the transformation. After the transformation, he went out of his house in search of work, and his income improved dramatically. Now, these are summary of the benefits of the Sri Lanka Cleft Palate Project. Over 700 patients underwent successful surgery from all over the country. The civil war was raging at that time, but we had patients coming from Japna, Trincomalee. They came to court, <coughs> and they also came for follow-up visits. And Michael remarked that the follow-up <coughs> attendance was much better than the follow-up attendance in the UK. So our patients are very compliant. It created the largest database of unoperated cleft lip and palate in the world. Created awareness and helped to establish specialized units in Gaul, Colombo, and Peradena. And the cleft palate services in the UK were reorganized. And now there are few centers in the UK where surgery is done. Earlier, it, about one or two cases are done in a district general hospital, and the results are not good. So uh, services are reorganized here. Then, Michael was astonished that when he first came to Gaul, 
that the country had only one speech therapist and she was in the private sector. Michael said, Great Ormond Street Hospital is in Camden town and the borough of Camden has 70 speech therapists. Then what happened was uh, a lady who provided the stage craft for Phantom of the Opera, she offered 250,000 pounds for any cleft palate project in the world. Michael sent this BBC, the BBC made a film of this uh, uh, project and it was screened on Channel 4 on KVD series which won awards. He sent a copy of that film to this lady and she said that my money is for Sri Lanka. And uh, a unit was set up in the University of Kalania and now we have nearly 100 speed therapists in the country. And of course, last a few of us received royal honours. So I have to acknowledge Professor Manohar Sen Nayaka, Dr. B. J. C. Ferrara, Professor Arjuna Aliare, Chandip Yalvis, who is based in Australia now, and a, a lady from the Postgraduate Institute who provided me valuable data. Thank you very much for your patience here. <clears throat> Lovely lecture, uh, fascinating topic, especially the last bit. Um, any questions? Uh, for yeah. Hi there, I'm Ben Campbell, I'm a general paediatrician in Vicargo, New Zealand. Um, I see you guys are still using the oral polio vaccine. Is there any um, recent cases of vaccine associated polio? Oh, yeah. Have there been any recent cases of vaccine associated poliomyelitis in your country? Not at all. Yeah. And any plans to switch over to the IPV? Uh, in the private sector, IPV is available. Yeah. In the private sector. And uh, so for private patients, we have the hexaparin, infant rich hexa, and that is good. Yeah, that's what we use. So I think we had just one case of a suspected vaccine-related uh, paralysis. I think that was in the early 90s, before polio was eradicated. Can I just ask a brief question? Is the incidence of cleft palate uh, and those sorts of anomalies greater in Sri Lanka than it is elsewhere? No, not at all. Not at all. Uh, I think frequently that question has been asked wherever I present this in many countries. Not at all. The thing is this we had a large reservoir because cleft palate is not a life threatening problem, it is a cosmetic issue. So, you see malignancies and things like that are given preference over cleft palates. And if the, patient, if the parents had sufficient money, then they would have got it done uh, in the private sector. Otherwise, they are in a waiting list, and then their place is sort of dislodged if another emergency comes up. So, it, there is no increased incidence, but a large reservoir, because it's not the priority for surgery. That's the reason. Right, well, thanks very much, Senator. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.